Welcome to the Mental Advantage Podcast. Whether you're an athlete trying to perform at your best when it counts the most, a coach or business leader trying to get more out of your team, or someone looking for more personal growth, this is the place for you. This podcast is your map to guide you to the right mindset, systems, and strategies you need to become the best version of yourself. And now, here's John Cullen and Brandon Allen. All right, welcome into the show, uh, the Mental Advantage Podcast. So tonight's guest, Dr. Matt Park. Um, who Brandon really just kind of a, you know, a little bit of a jack of all trades in a way you think about, he's somebody who's not only a sports psychologist, but also uh, does a lot with executive coaching. Um, and I'll get into some of the places you can find his content here in a moment, but really fascinating conversation yeah. to see that overlap. And it's interesting when Brandon and I first came up with the idea to do this podcast, it was the mental advantage podcast still is a mental advantage podcast. The idea was the acronym of map, which mm -hmm. was going to be to give people a guide, a map, if you will, on how to become a better version of themselves and close mm -hmm. that gap from where they are to where they want to be. And somewhere along the line, Brandon, we kind of went a lot sports focused when was never really the intention, right, even right. though organically we mm -hmm. kind of always knew that would be there somewhere because of our backgrounds. But, you know, no, for sure. But I think, I think, I think for at least for you and I, and for most of our listeners who are not probably clinicians, you know, when you're trying to, figure out how to apply things you have to go back to the things that you know right and so you know certainly for you and i it's it's sports related and and um team related i, I maybe not sports but just team related whether it's right. you know um but but it's it's really interesting because because dr matt is a as a young guy um has a lot of experience ha, ha, he has you know i mean he was an amateur golfer um he still does a lot with, you know, PGA and LPGA professionals. Um, he's, he's practiced. Um, I mean, he is a doctor. I mean, he, mm -hmm. the guy's just a, I mean, he is just a, a Swiss army knife. Yeah. With, with all the information that he has. And, and now with him and his wife doing their thing, um, it's it's amazing. Um, we we were really blessed to to be able to have him on, just like all of our guests. I mean, right. to be honest with you, it, it we've talked about it a lot. You know, we get better guests than we probably deserve, thanks to your efforts. But um, it it he's a good one, and um, I walked away with four pages of notes. Yeah. Um, because well, it's funny you said at the end of when we were off the air at the end there you were talking you told him you know I could sit and talk to you all for a long time like right. probably a lot longer than he would, <laughs> than he would want, want. <laughs> yeah. I mean I guarantee you it's longer than he would want um I that you damn be, yeah you can you can believe that so. <laughs> but but the, the reason I bring that up is it was so kind of uh, captivating natural yeah it was captivating because you know, when in the listeners, you're going to hear this, but when you start to talk to him, he really is that wealth of information yeah. that is like you, you could go any direction. And I felt like he could have volleyed with you in, in whatever direction you went with. 100%. That's what I was going to say. It was one of those deals that as soon as you go down this path, you realize, oh, wow, he really knows a lot of what that question was about. And, and, um, I mean, he, he's a guy that, that like, you know, the, the Brett McCabe's and the Dr. Moe's and the, I mean, he, he exactly a lot of them. It's, it's just, they've got so much that, you know, you could, you could dedicate a series of podcasts, um, with him and certainly would highly recommend you go check out his podcast as well. Yeah. No doubt. So just so the listeners know a little bit about him, as Brandon mentioned, you know, He's a sports psychologist. So as a sports psychologist, he has the Matt Park Golf Academy. And that's a, uh, you can find that online. 
Um, and then he also has the wholehearted living and leading, mm -hmm. uh, podcast. He's has mastering mindset podcast. He's got the insight company, which is the executive coaching, mm -hmm. uh, company. You know, here's somebody that's got 20 years of experience as a trained in psychology and in a clinical background. And that's sport and performance psychology as well. I've always found, and you mentioned Dr. You know, Brett McCabe and you mentioned, um, Dr. Mo. That when they have that like sports psychology mixed with that clinical psychology, mm -hmm. it just almost kind of takes that to another level. I think it's, sure. it's even, uh, it, it's just really fascinating. But for him to make that connection between, you know, executive coaching, EQ coaching, personal coaching, and that sports psychology and that overlap. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, I was kind of going towards when I was saying there at the beginning is even though our intention, was never to go just totally down this sports path. As you mentioned it, you know, our background was going to kind of lead us there anyhow, but it's also one of those things that I hope the listeners know, hopefully any of the things that we're talking about with coaches, with mental performance coaches from the athletic world, they understand, Hey, this is just as transferable sure. to my, my mm -hmm. job or my, you know, work parenting or whatever yeah. the case, parenting, yeah. whatever the case would be. So yep. you're going to find that, um, this conversation with that Dr. Matt is very much the same thing. So, uh, we will have all of the information about his websites and, and uh, podcasts in the show notes, but definitely, definitely get your pen and a lot of paper ready <laughs> because here is Dr. Matt Park. So, Dr. Matt, thank you so much for joining us this evening and, and taking time out of your busy schedule to, uh, you know, just sit down and talk about, you know, sports psychology, executive coaching, all of the different things that you are into. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you know, when you reached out, John and, and Brandon, I was uh, very similar paths, right? You, you guys are, yes. are talking on hitting on leadership mm -hmm. and we're talking about sports psychology and mental, like the mental advantage and and um so transferable so i really appreciate what you guys are doing here and the platform for Thanks. leaders whether you're executives or running organizations or athletes trying to enhance their performance in any way possible i think the mental advantage is really really um a hot thing and it, it's really important for us to kind of dive into so appreciate the platform absolutely no we can't wait to do it with you it's one of those things that you know, every so often, and I, I'd say every so often, this is probably happens just about, uh, every other guest or so is that I, we run into folks like yourself who, you know, as I do my research and we start to unpack all of the different things that you've got going on, some of the website content, some of your podcast content, your two companies will mention here briefly, um, is, it's like, okay, where do I begin? I even said that to you in a text message is my challenge for this evening is, not to just unload everything because you have so much good information that I've seen you share. Um, but I do want you to, and we always like to kind of start with some background for the uh, listeners is just talk to us a little bit about that journey that you had as an amateur golfer and your quest to become a professional golfer and how, as you say, everything that you were built for and, and driven to from an early age was to be a professional golfer and how that had an impact on the rest of your life. Yeah, great. So, you know, my my journey um, to get to where I am, I, I I played golf really young, right? So I started when I was four um, and grew up in the Bay Area. And we had a lot of good golfers, a lot of junior golfers that were really playing at elite level. So I had really good, um, a grooming environment for me to play competitively. So uh start the competitive golfing journey at six, and my life was literally everything, eat, breathe, sleep, golf, um, even slept with my putter, you know, when I was younger, <laughs> and, you know, those, those mythical things, but it was actually true for me. <clears throat> um, and I, I, I got really good, really fast and, and got recognized and, you know, I got scouted, scouted to play division one golf and got a full ride. And I, so I went to St. Mary's college. Um, and it was a local school, it's a private school, but they had an incredible program, uh, there, a great basketball team mm -hmm. you may have heard of, them, um, you know, with Gonzaga and Pepperdine and everyone, yeah. um, golf team was actually a really strong team. And, um, so when I got to college, it was the first time I was away from my parents. And when I was in college, I realized 
I was really exhausted. Mm. I, I was burnt out. And, um, and I didn't know it at that time, you know, burnout right now, we're using burnout. And I'm going to tie this in uh, to my story. Um, I deal with a lot of executives and leaders and, and that's a common theme. And, mm-hmm. and that term burnout is used um, typically in the workplace and the, you know, the World Health Organization defined burnout as having these three criteria. Number one was emotional exhaustion. Mm-hmm. Uh, two was like cynicism, having a little bit more pessimism and cynicism in life. And then three was ineff- inefficiency and ineffectiveness. Mm. And, uh, and, and these days, you know, burnout has been such a hot topic where Absolutely. many people are experiencing that not only on the work front, whatever, if it's athletics or business, but also on the personal front. I mean, it was never used in the context of like uh, parenting, but mm-hmm. we're a lot of us who are parents are experiencing parenting burnout, just constant emotional exhaustion. So I say all this because in college I was experiencing this, but I didn't know what it was. I thought I was experiencing a slump. Mm. So I kept pushing through. Um, now you talk about emotional exhaustion and inefficiency and effectiveness. I spent hours on the range trying to figure it out. So I was trying to per- perfect my swing and I thought it was technical and I was all about trying to have the perfect swing so that it looks good. I was really, you know, focused on making it look good. Mm-hmm. And so I kept tinkering and spending hours, but it, it was getting, I, I was getting worse. Like I, you know, I was, I was recruited to play, um, division one golf, full ride, high expectations. And I wasn't even traveling. Like it was to the point where I was struggling to qualify. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was the first time I was experiencing kind of shame and embarrassment. And, and I developed something called um, performance anxiety. I don't know mm-hmm. where it came from. I lost all my confidence and I had a really hard time. I, I was in a slump for many years and I was, I kept focusing on the technical game, just practice more, work harder, work longer. You'll get through this. Just, just beat it out of you kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That was my mentality. Uh, it wasn't until later I started working with a sports psychologist well, working on the, the mental game. And that was the moment where everything switched for me. Like I, wow. I realized like, I love this. Like, this is exactly what I was missing. No one taught me uh, at that time, you know, sports psychology was still on the hush hush. You know, mm-hmm. we had Bob Rotella yeah. who wrote those books, but no one really talked about uh, working on the mental game. It was still a little bit of stigma, but I was all in and, and that's when I changed my career and I got my master's in sports psychology. And then I got my doctorate in clinical psychology and I learned a lot during that process. And then I became a professor, a full-time professor in sports and performance psychology. Um, and then not only does it apply in the sports context and performance context, it applied to life and high performance and executives. And that's when I got recruited to work for NASA. And so I've been with NASA for about seven years as mm-hmm. an organizational development advisor for the agency. And I've been there. And then I have a couple of side hustles, as you, as you mentioned as well. Um, and, and so I'm here today with, you know, just this journey, this little kid who only knew golf and kind of failed at it miserably, but learned, um, you know, psychology along the way and and it came out of my hurt it came out of my pain and i remember i connected that to steve jobs quote um during a commencement speech he was you know sharing with stanford he said you cannot connect the dots looking forward you can only connect the dots looking backwards so as i'm sitting here today uh seeing that i struggled so much and was in this pain it it was the pain that connected me to my mission so, um, I share that story just as a background. So, so doctor, you know, you, you mentioned something and I, I, I've never even thought about burnout as an executive or even a parent. And I think that is such a, I mean, that, that kind of, that hits a little different, right? I mean, because it, it makes a lot of sense. And, and, and especially when you think about burnout where, 
<clears throat> you're so passionate about something, right? So whether it was um, golf or baseball yeah. or whatever, you know, you you pour and you give so much of yourself into these things um, to to have it now lead to almost another passion for you um, is pretty incredible. But, but as far as, as far as the, the burnout goes, you know, we're seeing it more and more at a younger age. Why, why do you think that is, is it, is it, there's too much pressure that people are putting on themselves or is it this external pressure? Is it both? Is it social media? I, John knows kind of where I, cause I, th- this is a topic that really, really interests me is what are those external factors that are really leading people to this place of, of just exhaustion? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, that word you said exhaustion, I think more and more uh, people are experiencing it. So mm-hmm. Going back to the definition of burnout and how the World Health Organization defined it, the first thing was emotional exhaustion. And just, mm-hmm. just connect with that. You know, think about what we, and, you know, kids, I think it doesn't matter if they're juniors or youth or adults. I think we're constantly bombarded with stimulation, with mm-hmm. information, right? We're constantly on uh, these things. These things keep us completely locked in. 24 seven, like we're, we're, we don't give our minds a, a break. Um, whether it's the smart devices, whether it's emails, whether it's, uh, teams meetings, we're just going from one to another. And I think at, at a young age, we're just constantly being bombarded with stimulation that mm-hmm. our minds don't really get a mental break. We, we don't, we don't necessarily have any type of space in our day. That's just white space where we just, you know, sit around and do nothing, which Mm -hmm. might sound kind of um, unproductive, but on the contrary, creating that space and doing nothing actually stimulates a lot of creativity and creates, you know, it it combats some of that burnout and emotional exhaustion. So going back to your your question and your statement, Brennan, I think um, the youth are experiencing burnout right now mainly because they're constantly bombarded with information and constantly stimulated that they're not giving themselves, um, you know, more opportunities to just play and have space and be bored. Be bored is actually a really healthy thing if you think about it. And and I think, you know, Dr. Matt, the other thing about this, and I'm going to connect these dots here because uh, I thought that was a really good quote from Steve Jobs is, the other thing I think goes on with youth is, you know, the comparison is the greatest, you know, enemy to progress, right? It's that, that idea that with social media and the influence that, that exists within that, I think about your own journey. I read an article that was written about you. Actually, you had mentioned um, NASA. It was in a publication, I guess, an online publication. And it was talking about, you know, you had shared with the interviewer that one of your biggest obstacles that you had to overcome was that that feeling that you were never good enough, like that when you were coming up through. And I think it probably if we really dig even deeper, not to flip the script on you here, but it's probably like that pursuit of not being good enough led to the burnout because you're constantly always trying to get better and better. But I think that it's I'm even imagining this, that. You're growing up, um, probably even before social media has even taken this evolution and it has taken now. And so I can only imagine what a young athlete that feels that same sense of not good enough because social media has told them they're not as good as this person that has this perfect life. What that does to the psyche, right? Like what that does to that person who now is even going grinding even harder and harder and what, how that would also lead to burnout. Yeah. No, 100%. I, I think, uh, the comparison, the social comparison is, um, it, it's, it's over, it, it, it's overwhelming in the sense of like we never measure up because what we see on social media are people's highlights, you know, right. um, and, they spend hours and days to get that 15 second clip of perfection mm-hmm. and, uh, and all the takes and all the, I mean, people are spending countless 
um, hours to do these trick shots that, you know, right. that it, it looks like it was so effortless. It was so easy. <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. And it's like, why am I not getting it? Why, why, why am I such a failure? Why, why am I not good? You know, as, as, as pretty as that girl or as handsome as that kid or as talented as that, like, and it, I think constantly being reminded of that does something to your psyche. Yeah. So, so Dr. Matt, do, do you see, I mean, I think, I think people outgrow it and, and to your point about connecting the dots, I think you have to have enough mileage behind you to really be able to, to connect those dots. And so I think, you know, maybe as you get a little older, but, you know, we're just now starting to see this generation that, that really kind of grew up with that comparison trap, um, they're just now starting to kind of get into the workforce, right? Are you, yeah. are you, do you see executives struggle with this as well? Um, do they to where they're, they, they go, Hey, I'm not good enough. Or, or is it by that time? Have they, have they kind of connected some of those dots? I guess is my question. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I think a common theme. Uh, even as successful as someone like Sheryl Sandberg, uh, CEO, you know, former CEO of, of Meta, of Facebook and, and mm-hmm. the author of Lean In, like many executives struggle with, uh, you know, concept that we call the, um, imposter syndrome. <clears throat> so executives like Sheryl Sandberg, uh, CEO of, uh, former CEO of Meta and, um, author of Lean In, you know, a lot of these executives have, imposter syndrome or they struggle um or challenged with imposter syndrome and and the imposter syndrome really if you think about it 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 um you can connect the dots of if you experience imposter syndrome it does a lot of healthy and good things it makes you drive and work harder because you never feel like you're you're doing enough so you work really hard and then because of the hard work and the grit you end up getting these successful positions, but that also breeds, you know, and you're starting to um, kind of flirt with burnout as well. So, mm-hmm. so it's a double edged sword in a sense. Executives, a lot of times, um, we're humans. So, what it doesn't matter what title we have or positions we have, whether you're an athlete, again, it's very transferable, right? Whether you're an athlete or an executive, it's the human being uh, challenge. And what's interesting was the study that was done uh, on Olympians, right? And there's a concept that we call counterfactual thinking. And, and you may have heard of this. Um, they looked at happiness and joy amongst the Olympic medalists. So you have the gold, of course, silver and bronze. Now put the gold aside and compare the two, the silver medalist and the bronze medalist, the three people on the podium. And specifically focusing on silver and bronze. And they, they were researching, okay, who's happier on that podium? And what they found was the bronze were actually mm-hmm. more happier than the silver yeah. medalist. And they were thinking, why? Like that, you know, that person got third place uh, in, instead of going home with silver. And what they found was it was all the, the mindset. It was a perspective. Uh, as a silver medalist, you were comparing up to the gold of what you did not get. I was mm-hmm. this close to getting gold, mm-hmm. man. Like it's almost this interpretation. Of, I'm the first loser. Like I right. just, mm-hmm. I could have gotten, gold. I could have gotten number one, but I didn't, you know, I, I lost that sense of loss. Third place is a little bit more disconnected from gold. So they compare themselves down and says, I'm going home with the medal. Right. Right. Like, right. Yeah. I get a parade. I'm going to go home with something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and they focus on the gratitude, right? They focus on the joy. They focus on just feeling grateful. Like, and, and you can see them in the celebration. You could see their joy, even as a bronze. They're just like, mm, you know, I, f- I feel it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful. And I think, um, whether you're an executive or an athlete, it's, it's that connection to gratitude as opposed to comparison. It's a comparison trap. It will always, no matter what you do, it will always be there because we are human. We just need to learn yeah. the tricks and tools on that. 
You it's know, a uh, really, you know, it's interesting. And I'm so glad you brought this up because on your website, the Insight Company, the website that you have for your executive coaching and, and listeners, please do yourself mm-hmm. a favor and yes. go to Insight Company. There's so many good resources on there. I like, you know, already have kind of a couple of things saved for my own personal journey uh, in the, you know, in business. But one of the, the the things that really fascinated me, and it goes along with what you're saying right now, is that the article, A Golfer's Mindset Can Influence the Way We Lead. And you share the examples of Scotty Scheffler and coming into the Masters and how, um, you know, it just lists a few of the things he consistently does from his daily behavior standpoint that that really helped him um, to reframe, if you will, some of the the way that he was looking at golf and you know, you mentioned faith as one and then finding the right support group. But the one that really caught my eye was the part about getting off that hedonic treadmill, right? It's the, uh, this idea that, you know, pursuing happiness and external things. I'll be happy if I win this tournament or I'll be happy if, and you, you mentioned in that article or whoever wrote the article was just talking about the fact that, you know, with Scotty, when he finally embraced this idea that, it, I'm more than just the golfer, right? It's, it's this, you know, you mentioned gratitude a minute ago. It's, I'm happy to be here for the opportunity. I'll be happy when I'm, you know, here in this moment and just really appreciating that instead of getting into that external, uh, focus. Yeah. And an exercise that I like to do with my executives is, uh, hunting for the good stuff, right? And, and my wife is really good at this. My wife studied under Brene Brown and, oh, wow. Um, wow. Yeah. So she, she re and she has um uh, certifications under uh, the Gottman method, which is a couple's counseling. So she doesn't do uh counseling per se anymore. She does more coaching and personal wellness um and, and well-being. But she, there's an exercise that came from Gottman and it's hunting for the good stuff. And literally there's an exercise that as couples um he does or he teaches uh, couples to do is um reflect back on three things that you appreciate about your partner that day. And um, what it does is we can, we can hunt and start to look for things that we want to criticize about our partner or about anyone. What you search for, you will find. Like if you want to criticize Brennan for anything, you'll find it. You'll, you'll look for a way to find it uh, and vice versa. But we're training ourselves, the psychology of training ourselves to look for the good and hunt for the good, regardless if even if a a partnership you're fighting and there's conflict and you can do this as an organizational leader as well, um, is you practice hunting for the good stuff. So Martin Seligman, um, the founder of positive psychology, he's out at Mm -hmm. UPenn. He, he did a study with writing three good things at the end of each day. So it's not three good things that I'm looking forward to. Then I'll be happy. The hedonic treadmill that we talked about. Mm -hmm. It's looking back and saying, these are three things that I really appreciate about today. And and here's why three, three things that happened today that I'm really grateful for. Well, one, um, my daughter gave me the biggest hug and I had the time and space to actually pick her up from the bus stop. And that, that feeling, um, I was really grateful for because my job gave me the opportunity to have that flexibility. And mm-hmm. so I'm really grateful for that. Um, two, you know, I, I'm working with an amazing trainer. Like he's just world class, but he has some really simple, uh, tips that I'm connecting with and I'm really feeling more momentum. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. So if you do these, this exercise every single night and you write it down, three good things, it's a very, it sounds very simple, but it's the discipline of writing it down, spending the time to do it every night. What they, what they studied, Martin Seligman and his grad students, what they found was, was after just three to six weeks of doing this, it radically changes one's perspective and one's life. Self-esteem goes up. Self-confidence goes up. Gratitude and joy. Um, the experience of it starts to increase. And, and I think these are some of the things that we can start to do when one feels burnt out, um, and feeling emotionally exhausted is just feeling in practicing gratitude. It's really interesting to hear you say that because one of the things that seems to be a commonality amongst a lot of people that we've talked to and a lot of successful people, not not only that we've talked to, but either 
that I've read or heard or whatever, gratitude plays such a huge, huge role in it. Um, and what's interesting to what you just said that I that I really like is, you know, most of the people that we've spoken with will talk about doing that gratitude journal in the morning. And what am I grateful for going into the day? I think that combined with doing it at night, man, that becomes so powerful because it 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 allows you to, like you said, kind of look in the rear view and connect the dots. And I think as long as you are allowing grace within yourself, right? And and to say, well, I was grateful for this in the, this morning or these were my daily goals and maybe I didn't accomplish all of them, but I'm still grateful for these things in, in the evening. Man, that can be a very, very powerful thing as you're going into the nighttime and as you're getting ready to go to sleep, because I know there's a lot of studies about kind of what you're thinking as you go into that theta state or whatever about how that almost reinforces itself. That seems to me to be such a powerful thing. And the timing of it seems to be critical as well. Um uh, that 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 is a practice that I am absolutely going to take up, um, and I, I'm going to start that tonight. That 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 one is really really interesting for sure. Yeah, uh, connecting what you just said, Brandon, about mm-hmm. um, starting it with the morning, mm-hmm. uh, the gratitude journal, and reflecting, and then ending it at night. I, I I agree. I think that's such a powerful combination. I think in the morning, what we're doing is manifesting. Kind of, mm-hmm. if, if you, if you know more about kind of manifestation and visioning and kind of uh, mindfulness and planning out your day, you'll be surprised how well your day goes when you can practice that and, and, and be in that joy and that gratitude. And then at the end, it's the emotional piece at the end of just feeling the gratitude, feeling the warmth, feeling like, you know what? My life doesn't suck that bad after all, you know, right. and it's that perspective shift and 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 um, we have so much things to worry about right we have so many responsibilities so many concerns so much fear and um in our lives and anxiety in our lives but i think gratitude uh, i always see it as a as a scale um like a teeter-totter the more gratitude you have the less fear and anxiety you experience the more um anxiety and fear then it has less room for gratitude. So practicing the gratitude really balances things out. Well, and you brought up earlier uh, when you said about what you search for, you will find it, it re- prompted me to think back to one of your podcasts, um, Mastering Mindset Podcasts, where you were talking about this idea of metacognition, which I, I mean, uh, it took me down a rabbit hole because I really am a, really getting to a point now where I've been focusing a lot on, you know, um, kind of th- this idea of like thinking about what you're thinking, right? It's this, you know, I think you, the way you say it in that podcast is what you search for, you will find and what you focus on will grow. Um, because of course it's taking all of your mental cognitive capacity to be dialed into that. And of course that becomes that thing. I think, um, Dennis Waitley, the, the famed sports psychologist used to have a great line that was, uh, it's impossible to concentrate on the reverse of an idea and expect positive results. Uh, yeah. because, you know, it's, it's that same kind of thing. So can you talk a little bit about metacognition? Because I, I just was really fascinated with this. Yeah, absolutely. So the definition of metacognition is thinking about your thinking. So. Um, I often ask a question, who's in charge, the thinker or the thought? Um, a lot of times the thought, uh, drives the thinker, hmm. but it's, it's almost like, um, you know, that, that, uh, in, in, so at, at NASA, um, they coined a psychological term called the overview effect where people, astronauts in space, all of a sudden they had this experience of the overview effect where uh, things get really small, like their worries and concerns and perspectives and uh, gets enlarged and their problems become smaller. And and I think um, this whole notion of who's in charge, the thinker or the thought. And it's, it's so that we don't necessarily have to attach to every single thought that we have. 
um, we often get controlled by our thoughts. And believe it or not, we have around 50,000 thoughts a day. Wow. And so our thoughts are constantly going. And I think the practice of mindfulness is to get above your thoughts and just to notice and recognize and become aware, but not attach. And, and so, um, this quote, you know, that, that I often use, what you focus on grows. It, it really, <clears throat> I work with a lot of golfers, a lot of really competitive golfers. And, and I remember growing up, um, my dad always said, Matt, don't hit it left. Right. And it's like, that's all I could think about. Like <laughs> yeah, left and the ball goes left or don't hit in the water. Yes. It's like, it's like a magnet. And then he would say like swing, <clears throat> this is, these are for golf coaches. And he used to be my golf coach too. He says, uh, don't look up. That's like, you know, it's right, like right, right, yeah, we right. do the opposite because the brain doesn't register the words don't or do not. Right. It, it, it doesn't register those, those, that language. And it's like saying to you right now, Brendan and, and John, whatever you do, don't think of a blue elephant. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Think of anything you want. Just right, don't think right. of a blue elephant. Yes, yes. And, it's the first and, thing and so it's, yeah, it's the first thing that pops up. Yeah. And, and so um, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but have you ever wanted to buy a car? Like you didn't have it yet. And, and, and all of a sudden you go on the street the next day and that's like the, the only see. car you see. You start, yes. Yeah. You just yeah. start popping up. And it's like, what, what the heck? Like, yeah. what, why are they all here all of a sudden? Like, uh, and, and it's because it was always there. We just wasn't really paying attention or focused on it. What you focus on expands in our awareness. It, it grows. It becomes a thing. Um, and, and I think it's, it's this, um, you know, I think that's a power of focus. It really is. So in my training, I really train on focus. That's one of the modules or one of the, uh, teaching lessons mm -hmm. that I focus a lot on because we get distracted by our focus, mm -hmm. whether internal focus or external focus. And we just need to know how to kind of shift back and forth, go back and forth. If we were distracted by the external things, like the, the, um, let's say the, the, the crowd or the audience or the scoreboard, if those are the things that distract us, then we have a per perspective shift and we focus on internal things like our breathing, a feeling, a grounding technique that we have inside. And that's our mind only goes there. We can only focus on one thing at a time. And if we're distracted by our internal thoughts, like we're in our head, and I tell them, use your eyes, get it out of your head. Like then we play little games. Um, identify five things that are brown right now. And then you're searching the room. And all of a sudden, after the third thing, it's like, oh yeah, what was I thinking about? So it's like you shift your focus to get out of your head. If that's where mm. distracting or distraction is coming from, mm -hmm. or you go inside. If the world is distracting. I, I think, go ahead, Brandon. No, I was just going to say, it, it's amazing to kind of hear that. Um, it, it, and you mentioned breathing just a second ago. And that, that, that seems to be a, a thing that um, gets lost on a lot of people is, is, the power of the breath and and bringing good clean energy and oxygen back into your soul. Um, do you guys focus a lot on that, Doctor? Yeah, um, you know I'm teaching that to executives all the time. Okay. The, the power of the breath, and it's not just the breathing that you're mentioning, which is so good and healthy, Brandon. It's the intentionality behind the breathing. So. When you take an intentional breath and a cleansing breath, um, I go one step further and I use the thoughts because oftentimes we think a lot, right? And, mm -hmm. and that we want to clear our minds and, and get to neutral. It's a, you know, getting to neutral is a concept that I'd love to talk about, but, um, I, I pair counting and, and breathing at the same time, or I give visual cues and breathe at the same time. So. It's a cleanse that not only cleanses your body and regulates the arousal system inside of your body, like slower, lowering your heart rate, mm -hmm. slowing things down, feeling calm, but it's also cleansing and, and activating your mind to not be a monkey brain, monkey mind, mm -hmm. but just to kind of ground yourself on one singular thing and, and to focus. So, um, yeah, for example, a breathing pattern that I teach is called circle breathing. And I literally had them 
fully 100% engaged with counting silently in their head and breathing at the same time. So I'll teach you guys this and then we can kind of um, try it together. But it goes, uh, you breathe in through the nose and you count silently for four as you breathe in through the nose. So breathe in for four and then you hold your breath for two and you slowly exhale through your mouth for six. So again, the, the, the pattern and the sweet sequence of one circle breath goes like this. You, you breathe in through your nose for four counts. You hold your breath for two counts and you slowly exhale through your mouth for six counts. And that's one circle breath. So I want you guys to try it uh, right now. Just, just one breath. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And, and the premise behind this, is why do we count and breathe? Well, a lot of times, like going back to metacognition, John, we're always thinking, thinking about our thinking, right? And we're, we're distracted by so many different things. And the thoughts that we get distracted by, if we attach to them, they often create a narrative, a story. Oh, what if this happens? Then I'm going to, I'm going to embarrass myself. And then all of a sudden that thought then connects to an emotional experience. Even if it never played out, we're just imagining it now. That thought, a singular thought, when we attach to it, we feed it and it grows and grows and grows. Now it becomes an emotional experience. Now I'm feeling something from that thought. Now I feel, I feel down. I feel anxious. Mm -hmm. I feel worried and scared. And the more that I feel this way, I'm going to start to behave this way. My patterns, my, my behaviors, my performance is going to reflect that just naturally. And it happens so quickly. A thought, uh, emotion, and then behavior. So in sports psychology, what we teach, we don't even teach positive thinking. We say, okay, that's later. What we teach is neutral thinking. It's so like, as soon as you have a negative thought, before it starts to become an emotional experience and a mm -hmm. behavior, and it's still there as a thought, catch it. Just be aware of it and get to neutral. Just practice getting to neutral. And the quickest way to get to neutral is counting and breathing at the same time or distracting yourself because counting is a neutral stimulus. No matter how much you focus on, on counting, it's not going to create a narrative or a story. It's not going to create a picture of the future or the past. It, it brings you right here in the moment. It, and, and the, and the goal is to really focus on counting and, and engaging with that 100%. Yeah, I, you you uh, made me think about um, ants that you talk about is that automatic negative thoughts, right? It's that, you know, as these things that just start coming, kind of coming into it. Um, is that along that same yeah. concept? Yeah, that you're talking yeah. about, that, that, you know, that's, um, that's 100%. Yeah, it, it, it is so amazing because I was even thinking about this as in our personal communication and our interactions with people as a leader in business, how what you just described, I think happens to a lot of people. It happens to leaders a lot where somebody has done something that they have a particular emotion to thought about one way or another. And now how often we never give them the grace to like, you know, by, by, forgetting that or getting back to neutral with them. And how often as leaders, we, we start to be like, Oh, they're mm -hmm. probably doing this. Like we start to read into all these, you know, kind of projecting all these like, uh, you know, alternative motives to what they're doing. And they might not even be doing any of this stuff, but because we had that original thought about them or, or, you know, something has happened that created that emotional response. Mm -hmm. Now, every single thing that they do, they can't get up from underneath of our, you know, gaze because we're constantly thinking that they're interpreting everything they do to be something negative. Does that follow? Yeah. And, and, and in leadership, we, we often talk about something called the ladder of an intent. And, uh, there's a pyramid that, that I show in my workshops where uh, the first rung of the ladder is limited available information. We, we gather this very limited available information. The next rung of the ladder is our observations based on the very limited available information we get. And then we go one up and that's our interpretations 
of our observations of the, uh, you know, uh, limited available information. And then on the highest, on the, on the top is our conclusions. And in conversations, we often uh, go limited available information and we just jump straight to conclusions. Mm -hmm. And if you l listen to difficult conversations, um, we don't get curious about yeah. why a person has that particular opinion. We just, we, we exchange, we're exchanging our conclusions. So in difficult conversations and uh, whether it's supervisory roles or, you know, exchanging difficult feedback, I, I, I really coach on, okay, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's get curious. How can we maybe go one up on that rung of the ladder and just share our observations? You know, John, you know, uh, after that meeting, I got this look from you and I couldn't quite interpret it, what that look meant. And I'm, I'm just curious. I just wanted to check in as, as, like, uh, is, is there something that I might have said that, um, that made you feel a certain way? I, I'm just wanted to check in to see how you're feeling after that meeting. And you're, you're like, like, what are you talking about, Matt? Like, I, I was just thinking about like my stomach hurt <laughs> yeah. my, at Jimmy John's. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't settle. <laughs> I, I don't know what look I gave you, yeah. but so imagine if we didn't explore that. And imagine I said, oh, that John, that jerk, mm -hmm. like he, he, I knew he, he didn't like me. Yep. And, and you gave me that look and, and that was confirmation. Oh, yeah. I, I need a, I need to talk. I, I need to give him a little, you know, uh, some feedback or whatever it might be. And we jump to conclusions and it, it bites us in the butt. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, let's slow it down. Let's get curious, not furious. Yeah. It, they, uh, the, we call that. In, in my line of work, we talk about listening to respond versus listening to understand, right? It's so often to your point, you know, with that limited information is somebody says something and my immediate thought, instead of hearing them finish their thought or seeking to understand as Covey would say, we want to just like, I can't wait for them to shut up because I'm getting ready to say this. And that's where to your point, there's that counterbalance is always like two people, neither one of them really listening. They're both listening to respond versus listening to understand. And, um, Brandon, yeah. I, I, I think it's really interesting and, and just, just some feedback that I've seen as a coach. Um, I, I will ask kids and I, and I, and I will absolutely preface the season in one of the first meetings. I will say, Hey, look, I, during the season, I'm going to ask you why you did something because I am curious, not because it's not the typical, what do you do? It like, I, I want to understand why you're making the decision that you're making out here so that I can understand how to better coach you. What's really interesting, and, and, and these are, you know, 14, 15 year old kids, right? And even a, a little younger baseball players. And they all get so defensive because most people will not take the time that you're talking about to analyze what that everybody jumps to a conclusion like oh coach doesn't think i did it right or we didn't get the result that we wanted and so now he's gonna grill me and sometimes it's just so hard to explain because i, I think i think kids get beat up so often emotionally by either parents or I mean, I, I, I've got three children. I listen to, I mean, today's a perfect example. I sent all three of them the same text at the, you know, in a group chat and said, Hey, did one of y'all get something on Apple? And within five minutes, one of them responded back and said, Oh boy, the youngster has not seems to be awfully quiet. And I'm like, yeah. why are you throwing them under the bus? But anyway, I guess <laughs> the, the point is, when even when you try to understand where they're at, it still gets people defensive. Is there a better way to to approach that? Yeah, 
you know, I'm, I'm very particular and careful with the why questions. Okay. Because in, inherent the why uh, is implicit. It's very implicit. It's very, um, I think, strategizing on how and intentionally how to use why. When when I when I ask somebody why did you do that, I think it it literally brings us back to childhood. Sure. Of of I did something wrong. And and there's an inherent message in that, uh, just from that that question or that word, why? So I often try, uh, you know, I'm, I supervise and I'm coaching coaches and trainers, and and I often uh, have them try to ask why questions and uh, using, um, and they cannot use why, so okay. they would have to think creatively. Okay, uh, walk me through that decision. Like, uh, how, how did you come to that decision? At that moment, uh, what made you decide to uh, go that route? Just curious. And I, I think when we preface it, and and so um, in in counseling, traditional counseling. So I, you know, I, I used to practice counseling, and and now I'm a full time kind of coach, an executive coach. But uh, we had something called check in and check out statements, and the whole purpose is to get permission to talk about something and to give them a sense of perceived control. So a check-in statement would be something like, you know, um, uh, you mentioned confidence. Do you, do you mind if we explore that topic a little bit uh, regarding, um, you know, today's game? Uh, do, can I, can I ask you a question about, um, earlier today and, and how that experience was for you? And it's like, they can say no. And it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to honor that. But it's almost like instead of, in, um, you know, forcing your way in, mm-hmm. they're they're literally inviting you into the conversation. So mm-hmm. one, it gives them a sense of perceived control. The checkout statement at the end is like, you know, um, I, I'm just curious. Did did that make sense? What I just shared, or how do you feel with that? Um, you know, I'm just curious. What, what are your thoughts? And did. It, you're checking things out. Did I get that right? When you do that, they have a chance to kind of give you feedback and correct you. So they have the last word almost. Sure. I think it's just that the the tone of the way we approach and enter into a conversation, as soon as we open our mouth and start with why, why did you do that? I'm just curious. Yeah. I just want to know why, but I think that word can get people defensive. Mm-hmm. So as a practice, I just try to avoid that word and come up with unique ways. Makes sense. I, I like the, uh, I like to use help me understand, you know, when you're asking some of those questions is just kind of get them to open up a little bit. And I think Brandon, you bring up a good point. Um, you know, and, and Dr. Matt as well, as far as this idea of permission, because I, you know, one of the things I like to, you know, when I'm training even like managers, uh, people who are, you know, going to be people leaders in our organization is I'll say things like, Hey, um, make sure that you're setting the expectation that you're going to be in a, that you're going to be providing feedback. You know, like Brandon was trying to do there at the beginning of the season is I used in the past Jahari window, um, as a good, you're familiar with the blind spots in Jahari window. And, and I think it's really good to just kind of set the tone and say, Hey guys, just so you know, um, you know, if I identify these blind spots, things that you don't realize you're doing, or would you want me to provide some feedback on that? Like, you know, you kind of almost set that up and get to get that permission early on. So that's just something yeah, to, yeah. um, to think about. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's great. I, um, my wife and I, we created this model called the success method mm-hmm. and uh, we have, uh, six different components on, you know, cultivating a high performing culture and team. And, um, S number two, um, is, is setting the stage. So yeah. it, it's those expect laying out the, the framework. And, and I think that helps build trust, right? Mm-hmm. Psychological safety is because a lot of people, when you say, you know, I, I, I'm in a position to give you feedback, but how would you like that? Like, let's, let's discuss the ground rules. What are the norms? Let's talk about this. So let's mm-hmm. set the stage so that there's no surprises. And that when I give you feedback, that's kind of what you've asked. So I'm going to keep you accountable to that. So I think it's really allowing people to set the stage, not only 
uh, in, in that relationship, but also in one's mind. So there's no surprises. And even when you have that permission, you know, for the listeners, you still want to take that moment to say, is now a good time for some feedback? You know, yeah. w- would this be an appropriate time? Because just because they've told you in the past that they welcome your feedback doesn't mean that in that particular moment when emotions are running high, that they're ready for your feedback. And sometimes as a leader, you can give feedback at the wrong time. And you usually know it pretty quickly uh, that that was the wrong yeah. time, <laughs> just based on yeah. either their reaction or the way that they uh, you know, come back at you. So speaking of that, that's going to, to, um, hopefully segue nicely into our last topic. And, um, if you have a few more minutes, uh, I I don't want to presume, um, but emotional intelligence, I know this is something that you guys talk a lot about with, with regards to, um, the insight company, you know, I'm a big, I love dealing with EQ. I know I like the way that, um, you guys, you know, have, I know you have talked about in the past using disc, you guys, you do a bunch of different things with either disc or, um, I took an agile EQ and disc assessment. Um, and I think the thing I like about the, I remember back to that workshop was I'm an IS. Um, and yeah. what I think is interesting about emotional intelligence is people, have to understand like it's it's important to recognize how the things that you do and would consider strengths or these things that you're kind of categorized in how that's now going to have impact on somebody else like you know the fact that i am um you know somebody who um you know is uh stuck in my like if i get stuck in my outgoing mindset for example well, some people might not want to be as outgoing as I like to be. And so that's going to create a very awkward situation for them. So I think it's just having that awareness too. Yeah, uh, that's great. So, you know, my wife and I, so we trained, uh, we're certified in, in DISC. Um, and then we also are, are certified in the uh, EQI 2.0, the multi-health systems, uh, emotional intelligence training. And and so what I love about this, the, the DISC, honestly, I, I use it all the time in my workshops. Um, is the simplicity of it and the complexity mm-hmm. of, of, uh, how much you can get out of the, the simple four quadrants, right? And, and, um, if you look at the disc, so you look at the circle and I know you guys are well versed in it, but for, you know, um, you listening yeah. right now, it, it, we, we talk about the cir- circumference in the circle and on above the line, you have, have two letters, the dominance and the influence. And that's above the line. And, and those people above the line are fast paced and outspoken. They just kind of whatever's on their mind, they say it. They're, they're the ones that are more vocal in the meetings and they, you know, um, vibrant and, and get things done quickly. So that's above the line and and below the line. Um, these people, the C's and the S's, they're, they're more cautious and reflective. Right. And then you split it down the middle and people on the left side of the circumference, they're more task oriented. That's the D and the C's. On the right side, the I's and the S's, they're more relationship. They're people focused. What's different for me about the EQI 2.0, about the emotional intelligence piece is polarities. And I, so I never knew how complex the word emotional intelligence was or this assessment was until I actually went through the whole certification and training process. Like for, for example, when you think of the word emotional intelligence, like immediately I started thinking, oh, it's just having more empathy. You know, it's just feeling and um, being good to navigate our emotions in that moment so that we can respond appropriately. And I realized that this assessment that I do with leaders, um, there's a leadership assessment, 360, and also a workplace one. But there's five composites, um, five different composites around the circle. One is self-perception, like how we perceive ourselves. This function right here, the self-perception is the inner work. So um, it's our self-awareness of our emotions, our self-actualization, self-regard. And then the next piece is self-expression. So that's like, now we understand our inner world, like how we relate to ourselves. Now it's about, okay, how do we express ourselves to the world? That's like assertiveness and independence and and things like that. And then we go into interpersonal relationships. That's, um, that's the empathy piece, the social responsibility and the interpersonal relationships. 
And then you have another, another composite is decision making. Okay. How does a leader make decisions? How impulsive are they? How good in problem solving are they? Um, what's their reality testing? And then the last piece, which is one of my favorites, it's stress management. How, how does this leader deal with stress? Um, their flexibility, their tolerance, their optimism. And under these five composites, each of them have three sub skills. And that's what we focus on on this assessment. And what I meant by polarities is when we focus on the sub skills, and that's, for example, one is, um, let's, let's take one sub skill. Like an example is problem solving, right? Let's say, um, your problem solving score was really high off the charts. You're really good at problem solving. And, um, so I would compare that on the disc, like a C, you know, very analytical problem solving, really good at solving problems. But let's say on the EQI 2.0 assessment, your assertiveness is very low. Now you have polarities, problem mm-hmm. solving high, assertiveness low. So how would that play out uh, for this leader? What, what would, what would we expect? If we had a very high problem solving and a very low assertiveness scale, ton of stress. you might see, yeah, yeah. You might see someone in a meeting who's really good at thinking analytical, solving problems, really great answers, but they never share it. Right. They don't, don't speak up. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, um, they're great at solving problems. They're very intellectual but they never share anything. And there, there may be, they don't share it in the meetings and they go behind the scenes and kind of the water cooler talk. So it's like, okay, as a leader, how can I balance that out? Mm -hmm. Assessment is really powerful because it highlights um, 15 different sub skills and it really can help predict um, navigating success in, in a very professional setting. So I, I love this assessment. I use it a lot. It, it, it's a really, really good thing. I, I was thinking when you were talking about that stress piece, um, one of the things I liked uh, that you had mentioned in one of your, I don't know where I saw this, but was talking about the reaction cards and kind of having your, you know, as a leader, having those reaction cards. But it, I mean, it all falls under that umbrella of awareness. It's like, you know, that self-awareness. And I, I really am. I'm a big believer in uh you know the disc model one of the things i remember going way back and and dr matt i don't know if they even still teach this because that but i did disc the um disc agile eq assessment like two years ago but way back i remember the first time i ever took disc what something that was very fascinating to me was they talked about your natural state and then your adaptive state. So it was like the natural state was just uh, on any given day, if you're just around the house, how you would be. But then how when I was at work, I was this adaptive D that was really high D, you know, like it started to change. Whereas when I was in a social setting, I was a little bit more, you know, I and S and, but then in, when I got into the uh, adaptive, you know, part of it when in the work setting, they saw where D became a little bit more involved, which I thought was really fascinating that we have a tendency to change who we are almost really at work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's interesting. Funny, John, it's funny. Cause it reminds me of, you know, there was that, um, during COVID there was, there was, I, I think it was a little video or a meme or something where when spouses or partners were working in tight quarters together, and they heard the other one use their like at work voice and how they were <laughs> assertive right. or, you know, and they, and you would see these videos and they'd go, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that I lived with. Hey, let's put yes. a pin in that or right. hey, yeah. Miss, or Mr. <laughs> or Mrs. Hey, well, let's circle back to that later. And and they're like, oh, my gosh, I, I live with like one of the people. Right. That, to your point, Dr. Matt, like. I don't like the circle back to it guy. <laughs> yeah. I want to take care of it now. Right. And I'm living with the circle back to it guy. Right. So it, that's right. just that's funny to hear you say that and share that, right. John. That's uh that's fantastic. So no, that's yeah. awesome. Well, I um 
Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got you. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's really, uh, really interesting, you know, just to kind of get into some of that stuff. And look, guys, I mean, there is so much information on these websites, as I mentioned, uh, the Insight Company, but Mark, uh, Matt Park Golf Academy, again, you know, that online mental training academy for elite golfers, you know, building that right mindset, emotional agility. There's so many different things you can catch up mm-hmm. uh with Dr. Matt on his podcast that he has Mastering Mindset podcast and then also uh he and his wife um d- do a podcast called Wholehearted Living and Leading which is a really really great uh podcast as well. So, you know, lots of great tools. What what else I mean, can people sign up I, on the Insight uh company website Dr. Matt? What are some of the things that they can get on there? Yeah. So, you know, right now we are um, really venturing into um, well-being and burnout. Uh, we're, we're, we're sensing uh, so much of emotional exhaustion happening at play. So uh, we're connecting the dots and, and our tagline is wholehearted living and learning or sorry, uh, wholehearted living and leading. And, and, um, we're, con- we're always learning, right? So wholehearted living and le- uh, leading. And, and I think we purposely picked living before leading because life is all around us, right? Uh, what we do when we put things in perspective, and I think COVID did this to a lot of people where you really mm-hmm. focus on what matters most. Mm-hmm. And I think we all, uh, we, some people live for work and some people work to live. But I think COVID put a perspective on us of saying, okay, like, why am I giving so much to my work and I'm emotionally exhausted and I have nothing in my tank to give to my family when I get home? Like I lash out, I, you know, I step in it, I, I get really frustrated um, and I have lack of patience, but these are the people that I love the most. This is, these are the people that I, I wake up uh, every morning to work so hard for, but I'm giving my best at, at work to, to my coworkers. Uh, and then I come home and I'm not showing up as my best. And, and, and it's this reverse psychology of, okay, wholeheartedness is a term by Brene Brown and wholeheartedness is, um, really being able to accept both the good and the bad within us. And we're, that's okay. We, we are human. And what it means to be human is literally I'm human, meaning I'm imperfect, but that's okay. We're all on this journey, this human journey together of, of self-exploration and, and being the best we can. And, and I think my wife and I are really noticing a lot of themes. I mean, constant layoffs, you know, zoom just laid off a whole bunch of people. And I just got um, uh, an alert. Disney just, you know, laid off about 7,000 employees and, you know, the tech industry, Google, 13,000 employees. So many people are, are losing, um, what they lived for. So right. I think it's just this, this shift of perspective of, okay, let's, let's live and cultivate the life that we love and then move into the different spaces that matter to us as the wholehearted person. And I think that's the connection piece, whether you're running an, an entire organization and you're, you know, you have um, huge responsibilities there or you're a stay at home parent. I think these lessons that we teach it can really connect the dots. Um, and, and so we, we do these webinars. We, we do these live workshops and trainings and that's all on the insight, uh, company.org org. So, um, and then we're we're gearing up to launch our podcast, the Wholehearted Living and Leading podcast. Um, but we're we're really hitting on this theme that many people are feeling burnt out, emotionally exhausted, feeling a little bit more pessimistic and cyn- cynical about the world, uh, which makes sense if you watch the news. And then this lack of efficiency and ineffectiveness, um, even though we're we're constantly grinding and we're feeling like we're giving it our all still feeling ineffective, right? We're not, we're not um, tapping into that deeper purpose and that joy. So, um, well, I tell you what, it's, it's definitely uh, the right timing for that type of a message. And, and 
the content that you guys are already putting out, I know is just going to transfer over into that podcast. And um, I think, you know, the listeners, you'll do yourselves a favor. If you're like me, you're already wrote, have written a bunch of notes just from this podcast, because oh, yeah. I know Brandon and, and myself, every time I was looking up after writing something down, Brandon was writing something down too. <laughs> so um, if, if that podcast is anything like this one has been, I guarantee you it's going to be more, um, you know, good stuff coming out of you all. So Mark, uh, Matt Park, uh, Golf Academy, and then uh, the Insight. And if you go to um, Dr. Mark, uh, help me with the website for Matt Park. Yeah, uh, so it's, it's, it's um, Matt is actually spelled with one T. So yes, that's um, right. It, you know, it's, it's so funny, John, that you keep saying Mark, because it, it's my, my, my dad wanted to call me, um, Marcus, Marcus Allen Marcus. when I was, yeah, oh, so, that's so funny. my name was about yeah. to be Mark. And my sister stopped and said, whoa, whoa, dad, what's short for Marcus? It's Mark, right? My yeah. dad was like, yeah, so, but she said, Mark Park. So <laughs> it's like Aflac, you know, like Mark Park, Mark Park. Like, uh, <laughs> so that would have been my name. And, I, and, I, I, and so I joke around it. But it's so call funny. Me Mark all the time. And I, I, I I love it. Yeah. I think what it is, and I wonder if there's research on this because I'm thinking I'm, I'm usually a pretty good reader, but I'm because I'm looking at Matt Park Golf Academy because I wanted to make sure I got that website right. But every time I'm looking at those two words together, your names, I, I my mind all of a yeah. sudden, and we've even talked today. So I'm like, I know, you know, his name's Matt. So oh, anyhow, sure. it's just a yeah. crazy thing. I'm sure there is some so, deep study going on about yeah. people like myself that <laughs> uh, great. Like a mix. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. If there's not, you'll start that study, right? Yeah. Well, listen, we so can't thank you enough. Doctor, we are. Yeah. So, so the website, dr. Matt, M-A-T, one T, one T, park.com. So Dr. Matt com. with one T park dot com. Yep. And then of course the insight company dot org. So uh guys, go out, get on you I found it on Apple um iTunes as far as the podcast goes, Mastering Mindset Podcast, and then be on the lookout, I guess, for wholehearted living and leading um the podcast that will be uh, Dr. Matt and his wife. So we can't thank you enough. I mean, speaking of, you know work-life balance and wholehearted living and all that stuff. We've kept you way too long, yes. uh, but uh, that's more a testament to you and all of the great information you were sharing with us. Uh, but we will definitely try and get you back on sometime in the future because I, I've got notes that I was wanting to get into and we, we just got on so many great tangents there that I wanted to make sure that we stayed with them. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sean and Brandon for, for setting this up and, and the platform for people to listen in and, and really, you know, um, learn how to have the mental advantage. I think that's, that's so important these days. Awesome. Uh, thank thank you, you so much. Have a great night. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Want to provide feedback or stay up to date with the show? Visit our Instagram page at Mental Advantage Podcast, or you can send us an email at podcast at mentaladvantage.net. To have John Cullen work with you or your team, please write to him at john.cullen at mentaladvantage.net. Thanks for listening to today's episode.